we saw actual efficacy in up to 40%, 44% of patients. We saw CRs in about, you can see here, in the phase two, 14% of patients, CRH in 9% of patients. We saw overall responses in a third of patients, as well as a percentage that cleared their disease morphologically. These patients did have a time period before they would respond. We believe based on the biology of the disease that this isn't a standard cytotoxic agent, but has to get into the cancer cells and turn on and turn off biological pathways, inducing differentiation and in terminal apoptosis. So the median time to have a response was almost two months. The response as a monotherapy was somewhat limited. We had a median response of about four months, overall survival of about five months. Oh, I have to say that a number of these patients that achieved a response given their very refractory disease were transitioned to allogeneic stem cell transplantation. When we look at the overall median survival was about 6.1 months. However, if you look really focus on those one third or, or almost quarter of patients that had a CR, CRH, you can see that the responding patients had a median overall survival of 16.4 months as opposed to non-responders that only lived a handful of months. So when you look at this curve, um, this is what we're looking for. Thank you, Eunice, for touching on that. You know, looking at these graphs, relapsed refractory AML is devastating. So to see activity here in heavily pretreated disease is very exciting. And you know, we will also see more data with combinations with this class of drug in the very near future, and very likely these medications will move in earlier lines. But the current approval is for 600 milligrams daily dosing in relapsed refractory settings. So you also brought up co-mutations. And some of these mutations are indeed actionable. Do we have any data on how ziftamenib does with these co-mutations and how would you sequence this? So again, most of these patients had failed prior targeted therapy. Yes. So I think for the ones that had co-mutations in FLT3, almost all of them had received a prior FLT3 inhibitor. There was no difference in response rates. The same number of patients responded to zivtomenin with or without a FLT3 mutation and with or without prior FLT3 inhibitor therapy. Interestingly enough, for the patients that had IDH1, IDH2 mutations, the response rate was actually higher than the median. So we saw 50 huh. or 55% of patients maybe having a response that had co-mutations in IDH1 or IDH2. There also, very interestingly, was no impact of prior stem cell transplantation or prior venetoclax-based therapy. Most patients moving on to experimental therapies received either cytarabine or venetoclax-based therapy. Patients who had previously received venetoclax, again, did just as well as those that didn't, which suggests that the mechanism of action of this drug is independent of those other cytotoxic, which is also, I think, promising in terms of us combining them in the future, having, having those different mechanisms. So we thought that this was something real. You know, I take care of a lot of patients with relapsed refractory patients, and as we know, the non-responder survival of just a few months is the norm. So the fact that we had patients going into remission, even a small percentage, and having that survival curve, we thought was evidence of something there. 